Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us as we approach midlife and move beyond have certainly had our share of disappointments and woundings. Some of them weren't so bad and for others, well, that's a dark secret that has loomed deep within a closet that probably will never come out. The question is, though, is for those of us who bury those deep wounds, what do we do as they continually guide our lives into directions that really we don't want to find ourselves in? Well, there's always hope, but you've got to be willing to do the work. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is an invitation inside the mind and heart of a woman who learned to heal her woundedness. She did this through craniosacral therapy and spiritual guidance. She gradually heals from depression, migraines, and life-limiting anxiety by consciously moving back into her body. A clear and honest memoir is what she writes as she takes the reader on a journey from existence controlled by pain and fear to a life lived in peace, hope, and creativity. I'd like to welcome the author of the book, Crowheart, Becoming Unwounded, which is a memoir of transformation, our guest, Keelan Anderson. Keelan, how are you today? Uh, Good, thank you. Now, how did you come up with the title of Crowheart? Oh, um, at the time that I was actively doing the healing that I talk about in the book, I was very interested in the animals around me and what sort of messages or how they talk to me. Um, and I had a set, actually I had two sets of um, sort of modern kind of tarot cards that talked about what animals bring into our lives. And crow was very much about going into the shadow. The story of Crow was about she looked at her shadow so intently that she actually fell into it, <laughs> and so she went to the other side. Mm-hmm. And so it's really about um, going deep into, I guess, the heart of darkness and seeing what's there and um, bringing it into the light. Mm-hmm. So few of us really either attempt to do what you've been able to do, or maybe we just don't know of a way that it's possible that we can move through something like this. Tell us about what that was like for you. Um, I think that in my, well, I I think I always have been interested in healing. So I think even as a child when I was in difficult situations and as I grew into early adulthood, I really knew that I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know the answers, and I knew that there was some way forward. So I think there's an inner drive for it that sort of pushed me. Um, I don't like pain. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) I think perhaps I've had lifetimes of avoiding it, and maybe there's a little bit in this lifetime of knowing that those are all dead ends. Mm -hmm. Um, So there wasn't really an escape. Uh, I really never – I always knew from, you know, early teen years when those things are available that – like, you know, I could have taken drugs, I could have been an alcoholic, you know, and I just knew that those were dead ends somehow, and whether, where that instinct comes from, you know, I don't, I would, I would say practice, but it <laughs> kind of depends on, you know, where, where your beliefs are and how you think you learned what you know when you come into the world. Now, it's kind of interesting how you write this, because there are times that I'm sure the reader is going to feel as though they've moved into some sort of a dream world as you write, and... That there, you know, I've done many segments over the years, and I myself uh, believe uh, the dreams are a great area for you to explore things, confront things, to to get answers to things. I mean, it's just, uh, that's you. That's your spirit. It's all of it culminating all in one area there, and you've got a night time or whatever the case may be to, to explore this. Tell us how you related that into your book. Um. I absolutely felt like dreams were a way to explore my unconscious and inner self and also messages that I was getting. Um, And so I I kept a journal, and I actually the whole book was written out of my journal. I I didn't. I wrote the book, oh, a few years after the end of the process where the book ends. And so I had to, I had all, all that came from journals. It wasn't, it wasn't like I could remember it all in that kind of detail. So during the time, um, I kept a journal of things I learned, a journal of things that were bothering me at the time, and then also any dreams that I could remember, I wrote them down. If the, if what they meant or some meaning came to me right away, I also wrote that down. Um, and then sometimes later reflection, even more meaning came out. But I absolutely think that it, if one can practice remembering the dreams and writing them down, that that's a yeah a deep source of information. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I get. I get so much information that way. So in my book, I actually wrote out the dreams. And sometimes I wrote 
what I thought they meant at the time. And sometimes when I, d- I left that out or I didn't even know what it meant, but it seemed to say something about the story, and so I just I put them in there. Now, we haven't really told or shared with the listeners what was it that you had to heal from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, until I was, uh, let's see, it was 30, 37, 38 years old, which is where the book starts, I, um, I had chronic depression and some pretty life-limiting anxiety, the kind of anxiety where I had, I would leave the house. I was a competent adult. I could be employed, but I, but I always was, was just had a low level sort of anxiety about leaving the house or about being out in the world. And I, um, I also had severe headaches, and I didn't know why. And I, um, uh, at the time that I started doing this healing, I, on the, uh, I started getting body work. And when I was on the craniosacral table, these images came to me. The craniosacral therapist was working with me, and I actually saw my father um, sexually abusing me as an infant and a young, like a toddler. And these were in images. Um, they were, I think that they never came up in talk therapy, which I had had before, because they were, the abuse happened before I could talk. And so I don't think I had words for it at the time. It was just my sort of feeling about why they're, sort of just came out in imagery or why the memories waited so long to surface. But all of a sudden, so many things about my life made sense when I saw that. I was like, oh, this is why I have these symptoms. This is why I have issues with men. This is why I have issues um, sexually sometimes. Um, This is why I feel like I have post-traumatic stress disorder and I never knew what the stress was or the trauma. And so um, that was uh, what I was healing from. Now, through this, did you pretty much feel that you did this alone or were you able to, you know, go to the person or people that were really involved in causing you this kind of harm? Well, interestingly enough, um, my father who um, did the abuse um, was already dead and he had died a few years earlier, which now that I think about it could be related to the fact that maybe it was safe at that time for me to do this healing and have those memories come up. As an adult, I didn't really know my father, so it wasn't like he was actively in my life. And whether or not I would have confronted him or talked to him, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I will say that since I have done meditations and journeys where I have talked to him, um, you know, in in that way and done some healing um, myself and sort of confronting either the part of me that's him or, you know, again, depending, I don't know the answer to what it is, but or him, depending on how that works. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I know that we have talked about grief, and they say sometimes that's the hardest part is when that person dies or is no longer there and you don't have the opportunity to have closure. It's like the door stays open, mm-hmm. but how was that for you? Well, I think that I get from this side, I don't, I don't so much remember the details of exactly all the steps of that grieving, but from this side, I know that eventually... Um, yes, I did talk to him, even though it wasn't with a live person. Um, there were meditations that I did to work on that grief. And also, eventually, through the healing process, I saw what going through that experience of incest taught me and how I wanted that information. Um, I realized that I was drawn to be a healer in this life and that in order to be a healer, I needed training and that that was my training, mm-hmm. that I have to know each step of healing myself in order to guide anyone else through it. And so once I saw that piece and saw how important it was for me to know the things that I know, then all I could do was have gratitude to him for participating in that contract. Even though he's responsible for his actions and he's responsible for his pain, I believe it was an agreement. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've, I've heard that so often too, especially from spiritual teachers, is that there's this agreement we make before we come into this life for things that we're supposed to learn, lessons, whatever it may be. But it's really kind of hard to wrap yourself around that as a truth when you see some of the things people have come on this planet and have done (laughs) or have, you know, had done to them, so to speak. Right, right, Mm -hmm. and absolutely. And I I, I don't want to leave out that once I started this healing process with the knowledge of what I was healing, I spent two or three years absolutely sobbing like a baby when Mm -hmm. I went to get, you know, help, when I was on the massage table, when I was working with a therapist. So I did, I actually, I actively did that grieving with, 
oh, I guess you could call, you know, your massage therapist or your NLP therapist a surrogate, right? They're holding space for you to let those feelings out that couldn't be let out when I was two. So I did have a grieving process that was very active and loud. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, when you started becoming a healer, how did you decide to move in that direction? Did you feel, wait a minute, you know, I've made it through this. Is it, that's possible. I'm sure there are others out there trying to figure this out as well. You know, it's interesting. That, that whole idea of helping others actually was a second step. The mm-hmm. first step was my fascination with the process. I see. So, my, my so the journey really was yeah. the reward, in other words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Steve Jobs was right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so my, when I got on the body work table, I had craniosacral therapy, seeing the mind-body connection at work, seeing that I would get on the table, she would work with my current symptoms where I was having pain in my body or sensations, and out of her working in that area on my body, that physical area, I would have imagery come up, I would have ideas, I would have some journey I would take, and that's what I found fascinating. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned that we are holding these things in ourselves, and that if you go to the area where they're held, sometimes they're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Now, what has it been like as you've been able to work with other people uh, in, in a process of healing, or unwounding, if you will? Tell me the first part again. I didn't hear well, that. I was wondering, what has it been like to work with others, you know, that now you've been through this journey and you've come through to be able to work with them, to be able to, you know, have the same process? Oh, I am so, I feel so honored and grateful every time, you know, I have a client in to work with and to be, I don't know, just have the honor of being able to assist someone with such, you know, deep and painful stuff and to see, to to walk someone through their own process of seeing that that deep pain and those deep stuck places really aren't as far away from the joy and release as we think they are. You know, when we're down in the hole and we're actively digging the hole and we can't really see the light because it's way up top and we're still digging, like if you can sort of coax someone, convince them to stop digging for a moment and look up, they actually might realize the hole isn't as deep as they think it is. And it's, a, it's an amazing process. And, yeah, it's absolutely mm-hmm. rewarding. And to be able to, since I know what I know in my bones through my own process, that information is all readily available, so I feel better able to be present. And um, they really can't scare me. I really believe that horrible, horrible things happen in the world. And so um, I, there are very few things that my clients have taught. Actually, actually, there hasn't been anything my clients have come and told me, and some of them have been really terrible things that I couldn't hold space for. And that is, that's the point of going into that darkness all the way. Mm-hmm. Now, what did you, if there was, and I'm sure it sounds like there was, like about really being in that darkness? And that, that, were you ever at a point of detachment? Um. Okay, meaning when so I'm... So you're there, okay, a lot of people, they, they own it, you know, it oh. becomes them. It's like, well, what do you do for a living, for instance? I'm an accountant, so to speak, okay? Rather than being detached, no, that's what I do. Was that was there a point where you could do that with your experience to finally say, you know, I'm detached now, I can see this, you know, across from me now. Not that it's separate from you, but mm-hmm. that, that there was that feeling of, of, of separation of something different. Um, I think that that's ongoing. I think that I wasn't very effective with clients until my story wasn't my story anymore. It was just a mm-hmm. human story. Mm-hmm. And so I think I worked the whole time, but while I was more attached to my own pain, I think I was less effective. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's an ongoing journey. I realize now, you know, I work differently than I did two years ago, Mm -hmm. and I have different clients that come in, and I'm able to work with more things. Mm -hmm. And if I don't care, I mean, it's when I say I don't care, that's how I describe detachment. It's not that on sort of a universal soul level, that's the level I do care about, but in my sort of human ego level, I really can't make them do anything. And so have any kind of attachment to their going anywhere is, is not helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in yeah. the big picture, I care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just it's such a fascinating uh, story when you realize that, you know, there are people like yourself that move through something like this. and But it, it's always with you, too. That's got to be kind of a hard thing at times to wrestle with, like, does it ever go away? 
think only, I think that only, honestly, it's, it's hard. I mean, now, talking about it, it really is old stuff. <laughs> um, I think that the, the residual things that bother me now and get stuck for me now, like I still have anxiety sometimes, and I find myself watching me have it, and so not only do I have the anxiety, but I'm watching the movie of the anxiety and wishing it would go away. It's kind of another level that makes it a little harder to wait for it to be gone. Um, I think that those things, oh, at, at times perhaps I can feel those feelings of feeling sorry for myself or like this is my pain. But honestly, if you walk with this stuff long enough with the intention of being as honest with yourself as you can, I really think that, and I, and I believe the literature um, backs me up, I really think that you get to a point where it really is universal pain. Like there isn't, um, there's that story where um, a woman who had lost her child went to talk to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, well, you know, I want you to go get me some mustard seeds from a house in the village that hasn't had anyone die in the house. And she went around to every house in the village. She couldn't find any. She came back without mustard seeds. And she said, oh, I get it. Everybody has pain. You know, this isn't just my pain. And so I think that's how it becomes... It, it's not a. It's not. It only really hurts in that tortured way when it's your own story and you think nobody else has that story. Now, how did cranial sacral therapy play into all of this? Um. So that was the first modality that I tried um, way back when I was first getting body work, where I got on the table and. Whatever she was doing, I just felt all these feelings well up, and I felt like such a big relief, and like she had helped me tap into something that, almost like an emotional dam that needed to break, and so that so that I could be free and stop um, holding back all these feelings of grief. So that's um, I just found it such a powerful modality. It works directly with the nervous system, works with the motion of the cerebral spinal fluid around the brain and spinal cord. And if you can actually get that motion in all the areas of the body to move freely in the way that it needs to, that's how you basically get the nervous system reconnected to these areas that we have this tension and pain, that areas that we kind of wall off because we don't want the tension and pain. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I just found it so effective myself, and I find it very effective for my clients. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned being in your body, and a lot of times I would think that when people have a trauma that can be as severe as yours, then who knows, everybody's different, yeah. they t- they tend to kind of go outside of their body, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. And there's where a lot of self-destructive patterns kind of happen at the same time, and you felt that moving into your body was a way of saying, no, we're going to be in this and take this ride together and just see where it ends up sort of a thing. Right, right? absolutely, especially when one is sexually abused. That's a very typical thing. You just, you don't, the body is not a safe place to live, and so you go live somewhere else in your mind or whatever other kind of place you can come up with. And you tend to, that sense of inhabiting, it's like, it's about sort of a presence and a sort of, it's about a presence and about feeling into those parts. And so we actually leave in such a way that we may not even feel those areas anymore. Um, And I think the, we're still holding the pain and the trauma in those areas. And until we go back and feel those areas again and bring presence into those areas, then that trauma and pain often will just stay. Mm-hmm. And so that's why moving back into the body is, is, is healing. Well, the other thing, too, is that when you kind of remove yourself, as we were just talking about, you're separate. You know, it's kind of like, ah, I'm leaving you alone. You're out there, and that's the end of it is that no matter how much you try to run and hide from this pain, it's always with you. And it'll find a way to manifest itself one way or the other, and it could be to a point where you're not going to like how it turns out. Absolutely. The longer that those cells are carrying that pain, they're not doing the job they're supposed to be doing. They're doing this extra job. And I believe that's where a lot of disease and things going wrong comes from, Mm -hmm. is that you're asking those cells to do double duty. You know, and they don't want to hold that pain any more than you do. Um, yeah, it'll just get worse. But but we all have our own journey and how fast we walk on that journey or what we're learning on that journey or how the journey progresses is so individual that 
that, you know, if someone is sitting there, they're in pain and they're still fighting with it and they don't want to be in their bodies and that's where where they are. You know, that's where they need to be, even though it hurts. They have to decide to change it. Now, what advice would you give for our listeners, you know, if they want to start on a journey like this? Oh, <laughs> to start at the beginning. <laughs> um, I Well, I would start with body work. If, if someone feels that they have some physical symptoms or even, you know, it can be emotional and spiritual symptoms as well, but some symptoms that something needs to change, something hurts, um, I would absolutely recommend going and getting some kind of body work. You try cranial psychotherapy, that's the one that really works for me, but there's so many kinds out there. Go get on a body work, massage table, acupuncturist table, and open yourself up to what might come up as you're lying there. And notice um, emotions that come up, notice your feelings, and then find somebody to talk to. And I think that's a, a very good way to start. Mm-hmm. I think it does need to happen, you know, because maybe it's, it's because trauma often is childhood trauma. I mean, certainly we can be traumatized as adults, but a lot of the habits that we're carrying around as adults, we formed really early. Mm-hmm. And because um, children is a, it's a, it's something that, you know, childhood happens with adults. <laughs> and I think that to heal those things, they need to be witnessed. Um, there's just something about, it's, it's pretty tricky to do it on your own. You kind of need those feelings to be seen. You kind of need those, what you have to say to be heard. So I would get, you know, professional help, and that could be there's a, such a wide variety of different kinds of therapy, whether it's talking, whether it's mind-body, and whether it's body. Now, did you find that as you have healed that you feel that you're more present, you're more in the moment, you're more alive than ever before? Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, I have my moments of resistance. But... Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not there all the time. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you compare my life to the time when this, when I started this, well, the time the book starts at, um, my life is totally different. I have, I, I would say it's the opposite. Rather than spending most of my time in a really depressed and stuck state where I really, you know, I wasn't suicidal such that I wanted to kill myself, but I wouldn't have cared if I died. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, now it's the opposite. Well, I, I never feel like, well, actually, I don't mind if I die now, but it's a different reason, <laughs> sort of a spiritual peace with death, I guess. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, I would say, I don't know how to put a percentage on it, but it's probably over 90% of my time. I, I feel pretty darn joyful, and that is completely bizarre and opposite from what I ever believed could be possible, you know, seven, mm-hmm. eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, how can people find out how to get a hold of your book, Crowheart? Okay. They can go to my website, which is joyworkmindbody.com, and there's a little link there. The cover of the book is there. You can see, and there's a, a link to where you can buy it. Um, it's just on, a, on Lulu, which is a, you know, a site you can buy it from. Um, yeah, so just a link from my website. Well, very good. Well, Kaylin, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's always encouraging to know people like you out there have found a journey that was worth taking and sharing it with others, and that at the end of the road – not that there's ever an end, that the possibilities become unlimited. And that's kind of a very refreshing feeling for people to know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. And give out that website one more time for our okay. listeners. It's joyworkmindbody, all one word, dot com. Joyworkmindbody.com. Our guest today, Keelan Anderson. The book is Crow Heart. And Keelan, again, thank you for joining us here on the program. I'm Daniel Davis. We want to thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at beyond50radio.com. We'll certainly have a hot link for you to explore more as well on Crowheart. Again, thank you for joining us. And remember, live your day past halfway.